I'm Mike Fairborn of Weather Center 4. And I'm Matt Bailow, Weather Center 4. All of us are becoming more aware of the tropical rainforests of the world, the Amazon in Brazil, or the highlands of Central America. It's important to remember that the great forest that surrounds the Great Lakes here in North America has been cut and burned, too. That was during the years when the people thought they would never run out of woods. Well, we treat our forests a little differently now. More of us realize how much our quality of life depends on having forests around us, how important it is to replace the forests we use, and how we can maintain the forests we have. So with the help of the U of M's College of Natural Resources, we have created a series of stories about forests and forest conservation. At the beginning of each story, we'll pose a question for you to think about. If you're watching with a worksheet, make some notes, maybe on a separate piece of paper. At the end of the story, we'll have answered the question and show you a list of the correct answers. Then you can check your notes, and when you have time, put the answers on the worksheet. Our first story is called Trees of Life. Now, as you watch, think about the five most important values the forest has for each of us. The towering 200-year-old Norway pines at Itasca State Park can make you feel at one with nature, in touch with its wildness. It's a peaceful feeling called wilderness, an appreciation of the natural balance and order in life. It's one of the forest's most important values for us, and Minnesota's first forest people, the Ojibwe Indians, understand the feeling well. We were one time, as the deer lived, we lived in the forest, and the forest was our home. And we're still spiritually connected to that. And uh, what I would like young people to understand is that when you walk into the forest, you're walking in someone's home. And the forest is home to more than trees and other plants. Wildlife of every shape and description depends on the forest for its food and shelter. Anyone who's walked in the woods or skied through the pines knows how much fun it is to see the animals that live there. Recreation is another important value of the forest. One of the earliest uses people made of the forest was gathering wood for their fires. And lots of the most common things we use every day come from trees. Forests also help conserve water. When it snows or rains on trees, their leaves catch the water and slow it down. Forest soils are spongy, full of dead leaves and branches that absorb and hold the water. As our demands on the forests increase, for either wood or wilderness, we must remember how much the quality of life on our planet depends on its forests. Know that when you take a tree to give thanks that the tree died, so you made a house or you made paper, and that if you take a life of an animal, same thing. We're all endowed with that same spirit. We need to respect that. And the forests are the home for all of us. In fact, according to one of the folk traditions of the forests of northern Europe, the entire universe exists within the roots and branches of a giant ash tree. In Minnesota, more than one-third of our land is covered with forests. In Wisconsin, it's a little more, 40%. So what are the five most important multiple values or uses of the forest? They are wood, water, wildlife, recreation, and wilderness. Trees are the largest members of the plant family, but how do they grow so big, and how do they change the soil at their roots into leaves and fruit? In our next story, Sun Sugar, we'll learn about the four things a plant needs to make the sugar it uses to grow. And in the bargain makes oxygen, which animals breathe. It's a remarkable process called photosynthesis. Well, you can see that there are lots of different kinds of forests. A forest like this has a very variety of uh, different kinds of trees and species. Two distinct types of trees grow in the forest of the upper Midwest. Coniferous trees like pines, which keep their leaves, or needles, year-round, and the broad leaf trees like aspens, which shed their leaves each fall. A tree, like other plants, has several important components that allow all The those... parts of a tree work together to make it grow. The roots of the tree reach into the ground to gather water and nutrients from the soil. The stem or trunk of the tree carries the nutrients and water through the branches to the leaves where the magic of photosynthesis takes place. Trees are remarkable factories, and like any other manufacturing process, they have raw materials that they use to make something. In the case of trees, they use the resources provided from the earth. They use water, they use the nutrients that the soils contain, and they combine those in such a way with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere using sunlight as the driving energy force to create sun sugar, which is really a cellulose form which allows the tree to build and to fuel its reproductive processes. 
The other product of photosynthesis is oxygen, which animals breathe to live. I bet everyone recognizes this. The amounts of each of the building blocks a tree receives will determine how well it grows. Notice how close the rings get together towards the outside of this tree in its most recent years. Might have been crowded by some of its neighbors. You know, if you get, if you get too crowded, uh, your crown can't get quite as big, so you're not going to catch as much sun and sun sugar. Let's compare that to this tree. What's different about this one? It has bigger rings. Yeah, lots more, lots more sun sugar there, right? The carbon dioxide that trees use to make sugar is the same gas that animals breathe out. The lives of the plants and animals were in balance until people began burning lots of coal and oil. Trees are unique from other plants in the fact that as a result of making that sun sugar or cellulose, the carbon dioxide is locked up for long periods of time in the stem, in the wood part of the tree. Because there are so many sugar factories in the leaves of trees, an acre of forest locks up 10 times as much carbon dioxide as an acre of farm crops. When we burn trees, that same carbon dioxide returns to the atmosphere. So if we burn more trees than we grow, we put extra carbon dioxide in the air, which makes the atmosphere a better blanket around the earth. It's a process that may cause global warming. So what are the four things trees and other plants need to grow? They are sunlight, soil nutrients, water, and carbon dioxide. Animals provide some of the carbon dioxide that plants need. Plants provide the oxygen which animals need. But the plants and animals of the forest depend on each other in other ways too. They're bound together in a web of life. It's an intricate series of connections, like the links in a chain, called the forest food chain. The forest, even in the quiet of winter, is a complex system of plants and animals that need each other. This downy woodpecker needs some insects for a meal. Insects that spent the summer eating tree leaves. Most of the animals of the forest eat plants, nature's first link in the forest food chain. Trees and green plants are food producers. Using the sun as an energy engine, they take in carbon dioxide from the air, they mix it with water from the soil, and they form a simple sugar. Now consumers, such as an insect or animal, will come along and eat the sugar by nibbling on the leaves or by chewing the bark. The animals of the forest are either generalists or specialists. Deer, for example, are generalists. They'll eat most kinds of plants. The rough grouse, on the other hand, is more specialized. It likes the seeds and buds of aspen trees. Now down the line, another consumer, a larger animal, will come along and eat these early consumers. And this will form a food chain. When an owl eats a smaller bird, it adds another link to the chain of life. In its turn, the owl might be eaten by a lynx or bobcat. And finally, the last predator in this interconnected web of life dies. Now to complete the cycle, Recyclers such as fungi and bacteria and even earthworms will go to work and break down the dead material. They decompose the nutrients, return it to the soil, and then the trees and plants can use it again. That soil, nutrient, and the water. People are part of the forest food chain too. We depend on the plants and animals for our food. And just like the plants and animals of the forest, if any link in the chain is broken, our well-being can be put at risk. For many years, people have treated nature as an adversary, an enemy to be conquered. But the more we learn about nature, the more obvious it is that we are part of the natural order, just like the other animals of the forest. That's why planting trees and taking better care of the forests we have are so important for keeping a strong first link at the forest food chain. What are the main links in that chain, the producers, consumers, and recyclers of the forest? They are plants, the producers, animals, the consumers, and the recyclers, fungi, and bacteria. In our next story, we're going to learn about the four most important forces that change the chain of life in the forest. Fire is the oldest and the most dramatic force. Lightning causes lots of forest fires, and so do people, by accident or on purpose. In fact, until the 1950s, people were still using fire to clear forest land in northern Minnesota and Wisconsin to make way for farms. Fire and the way we manage the control of fire is still changing our forests. Wildfires burned through millions of acres of forests in the dry summer of 1988. When it was over, the charred tree trunks in Yellowstone Park told of the fire's fury. Uh, There's a forest car. But forests can withstand the changes caused by fire. At the base of these Norway pines in Itasca State Park, you can still see the scars of fires from 250 years ago. 
Plants return to the forest floor soon after a fire. It's part of a natural process called succession. And trees that like lots of sun grow back first. The jack pine and the aspen tend to come in after a fire. They're pioneer species. They're adapted to the conditions that uh, the fire creates. Weather and climate changes can affect the forest, too. Strong winds can knock over the biggest trees, making room for new ones. Forty years ago, uh, you could scarcely find a young pine tree in the park. Pests, like diseases, weren't killing the pines. Too many deer were. So in 1937, a fence was built around a part of the forest at Itasca to keep deer out. And the white pines have thrived with a more natural balance we established. But the biggest force that's changing the forest today is people. Our control of forest fires, our demands for farmland, and our harvest of wood products like lumber and paper have changed the natural balances and altered the pace of forest succession in ways we are only beginning to understand. If people and fires don't interrupt the natural succession of the forest, eventually young trees that can grow in the shade of their parents will dominate a forest stand. In our region, that's a forest of hardwood trees like sugar maple, ash, and basswood. So what are the four most important forces that change the natural succession of the forest? The answers are weather, fire, pests, and people. There are two main types of forests in our region, coniferous or pine forest in the land near the Great Lakes, and hardwood forest on the land between the pine forest and the prairie to the west and south. Early European settlers logged all the pines and burned what was left to make farmland. The soils, though, were poor and most of the farms were abandoned. So today, aspen, a hardwood tree, covers much of the land where pines once stood. It's the most common and now the most important tree in our area. Why? Because we use it to make paper. As you watch our next story, Papermaker, keep track of what it takes to make paper from those aspen trees and from the paper we throw away. Bring it up very slowly. There's your sheet of paper, Anthony. Oh, look at that. At St. Anthony Park Elementary School, students are learning how paper is made. It takes a lot of water to make paper, doesn't it? It takes a lot of pulp wood, too. In the aspen forests of northern Minnesota, more than 20 million aspen trees were cut in 1989 to supply our paper mills. If you harvest aspen and if you do it by clear cutting so that you bring a lot of sun and the chances for water and so forth into the site, uh, aspen will come back by itself without any replanting and it comes back very, uh, very aggressively. Aspen trees are nature's way of covering the land after a fire or today a logging operation. New trees spring from root suckers and from stump sprouts. Within a year, thousands of aspen trees will cover a clear-cut site. We take small patches of timber, we leave islands for wildlife and so forth. So when you get finished, you have a forest which in many ways looks very much the same as if a wildfire had come through. But we obtain the benefits, raw materials to fuel our industry and provide goods that you and I use every day. But paper from pulpwood isn't the only way to make paper. Now we're going to make it from recycled fiber or waste paper. And notice it's got the gray color, doesn't it? About 25% of the paper we use is recycled waste paper. Getting paper whiter takes a lot of chemicals. Natural paper is tan colored, so chlorine, a poisonous gas with harmful environmental side effects, is used to bleach the paper white. And we often choose the whitest paper we can find. But in doing that, we should realize that we are also uh, selecting a piece of paper that has a fairly high environmental impact associated with it. And if we would pick a sheet of paper that even had a few points lower of brightness and whiteness to it, uh, the impacts associated with that would be, would be significantly less. We can make a big difference to our forests and our water by buying paper that's less white than we're used to, or by buying unbleached paper made from waste paper. And by recycling our own waste paper, we won't have to cut as many aspen trees to make our paper. So what are the ingredients you need to make paper? They are pulpwood, or waste paper, water, and chemicals. We've learned how the pine forests in the northern parts of Minnesota and Wisconsin have become aspen forests. But what about the hardwood forests of southern Minnesota? There, too, our demands for wood products are changing the forest dramatically. The oaks, one of the six main types of hardwood trees in those forests, are being cut faster than they're growing. 
Oaks are very valuable for wood products, lumber, veneer, and fuel wood, and many of them are being harvested in Minnesota. In southern Minnesota, more oaks are being harvested right now than are being grown. The oaks of Nurstrand Woods near Fairbow used to provide people with lumber and fuel wood. Today, they provide recreation and a bit of wilderness. They're part of a state park where you can see what Minnesota's hardwood forests look like. This giant red oak must be 34 inches in diameter. It's one of the biggest I've seen in Minnesota. All of Nurstrand once looked like this. It had huge red oaks, sugar maple, basswood, ash, just huge big trees. And these were harvested mainly for wood products and fuel wood by the early settlers. Minnesota has six main types of hardwood or deciduous trees, trees that lose their leaves each fall. Elm trees line the boulevards of many of our cities. Aspen trees, which are used to make paper, grow throughout the state. Maple trees with their pointed leaves have seeds with whirly bird wings. Ash trees, which are named for their ashy gray bark, make good baseball bats. Basswood trees have dark green heart-shaped leaves and two varieties of oak are common here white oak with rounded leaves and red oak with pointed leaves. At Tui Furniture Company near Rochester, oaks from Minnesota's forests are made into high quality office furniture. The Tui family has been building furniture and planting trees for three generations. They want to be sure they can keep building furniture with our native hardwoods. The forest is always changing. There are trees that die and there are new trees that regenerate. It's important for us to, in the long run, be able to manage that forest to perpetuate all those valuable resources. In suburban Twin City areas, some oaks are being injured during building construction. As a result, they become vulnerable to oak wilt, which can kill a tree in a few months. Other oak trees are getting oak wilt because people prune them during the wrong time of the year. Like other hardwoods, oak trees should only be pruned in winter when the sap isn't running. Can you name the six most common tree species of our hardwood forests? The correct answers for the worksheet are oak, maple, basswood, ash, elm, and aspen. Oaks are not vanishing from one of the most interesting forests in Minnesota. It's near Lanesboro in the southeastern corner of the state. It's a demonstration forest where Joe Dayton, a good example of a woodland steward, is growing lots of different things besides lumber in the forest he's taking care of. As you watch, notice the variety of animals that depend on the woodlands. We have the largest shiitake mushroom demonstration on hardwood logs or on logs in the English-speaking world. These oriental mushrooms grow well on the red oaks that flourish in the forests near the Root River in southeastern Minnesota. People at the Forest Resource Center are studying which logs grow the best mushrooms the fastest. And they're also growing more of the red oaks that grow mushrooms best. We're looking at an oak clear cut that was put in here. It's about six acres in size. Oaks are a pioneer species. They need bright sunlight to regenerate. So we're looking in and getting in, opening up, relieving snags for wildlife, we're piling slash for wildlife, we're doing anything that we can to be a multiple use sort of concept, beneficial for wildlife, beneficial for man. When we think of forest wildlife, bats don't usually come to mind, but they too are part of the forest community. Would you rather have mosquitoes or bats? Uh, they're a natural element. They eat the mosquitoes in large numbers. Uh, they're beneficial for pollination, uh, and we look at them as being a very favorable creature. Another misunderstood animal is the timber rattlesnake. It, too, lives in the hardwood forests. Most people normally think of, of, of deer and, and more common creatures, but we are trying to expand their horizons a little bit with our bat condominium, with our osprey nesting platform. Uh, and, and trying to get people to look beyond what they conventionally think of for, for wildlife populations. An animal that had disappeared from Minnesota's oak forests was the wild turkey. Now the turkeys have been reintroduced and they're thriving. The forests at the Forest Resource Center are being managed to create different aged sands, a more nature-like, diverse condition. And now there are a lot more songbirds at the center than there used to be. It's being a responsible steward of taking care of what we have, of realizing that we are concerned about global warming and harvesting the rainforest, but we should be more concerned of what's happening in our own backyard. Some of the high quality walnut trees that Joe is growing at the Forest Resource Center will bring more money per acre than corn. It takes a hundred years though before you can harvest the crop. 
Did you notice the wide variety of animals that are thriving in the diverse environment of the Forest Resource Center? Can you name six that depend on our hardwood forests? The worksheet answers are wild turkeys, squirrels, songbirds, deer, bats, and timber rattlesnakes. When we talk about forests, most often we think of rural areas. But if you've ever flown in a plane over the Twin Cities, you can see that the trees in our urban areas make a forest too. But did you ever stop to think about the many benefits we get from our urban forests? As you watch, notice the ways city trees make our lives better. Each winter, crews from our city parks departments prune the trees that line our streets. Whether it's done from a cherry picker or on the ground, the work they do keeps our city trees healthy. And healthy trees are important for more than just beauty. Trees are what makes our environments nice to live in. If we just lived in places that were all buildings and asphalt, they'd get too hot. We wouldn't see any birds. Um, when the rain came down, it would just all run off and it would be even hotter and drier. Besides, think how noisy our cities would be if trees didn't absorb some of that noise. And think of all the animals that wouldn't have homes if our cities didn't have trees. And trees keep our city air cleaner. Just the hundreds and thousands of leaves that are in a tree help collect dust. You know, they're just like a, a filter. In Circle Pines, the community has made a special effort to plant trees. Outside the city hall, they've planted a windbreak of Norway pines. In a new housing division, a variety of trees have been planted by an active city forestry department. I've seen figures that say urban trees for energy conservation are 15 times more useful for reducing carbon dioxide than the same trees in the woods. Each of our homes can benefit from planting trees. In winter, hardwood trees like oaks or maples on the south side of the house will let the sun shine through and warm the house. In summer, their leaves will shade the house and provide natural air conditioning. I know when I was uh, younger, I climbed trees and uh, had tree forts and did all kinds of things in trees. So trees are just really fun to play on. They're, they're good for our parks and our recreation areas. Besides making our cities and towns more fun to live in, trees planted in a city are 15 times more valuable in reducing the greenhouse effect than trees planted in the countryside. The list of important things city trees do for us is long. How many of them did you notice in the story? Well, the worksheet answers are reduce CO2, or carbon dioxide, absorb noise, cleanse the air, wind breaks, air conditioning, animal homes, and recreation. Our next story looks at one of the most familiar ways we use the forest and its products in the fireplace. As you watch, keep track of the four things you need to burn this renewable energy source safely and cleanly. Every year in Minnesota, more than three million trees are cut for firewood. When we're felling trees, we don't want to take the best trees. We want to take the trees that are residual trees, the trees that are not good for any other value. Most fireplace owners get their firewood already cut and split. But if you like the exercise, you can split it yourself. And split wood is the first step in burning wood cleanly. When we're splitting that wood, the object of splitting is to make it dry faster and also, of course, to fit our stoves. And it usually takes about 9 to 12 months to dry wood properly after it's been cut and split. Dry wood burns more cleanly than wet wood, and some fireplaces use the heat energy in the wood better than others. When you load a fireplace or a stove, you want to be real careful because they are hot. For we to burn wood safely, we, need, we do need a safe stove. And the safe stove means that it has been listed and tested and listed by an appropriate agency like Underwriters Laboratories. Newly designed fireplace stove inserts draw cooler air from the room into the space around the firebox. There, the air gets heated and goes back into the room. Is it warm? Yeah. <laughs> the trick with using a fireplace for heat is catching the heat from the wood before it escapes up the chimney. And a proper chimney is essential. Once you've got everything working right, maintenance is important. But why would a young person want to know about all this? Because wood, burned safely and cleanly, is a good alternative to other sources of heat energy. Now, wood energy, of course, is something that is a renewable energy source. It is something that we can grow again and again compared to fossil fuels, which are uh, they're fixed in that ground over millions and millions of years. And once we burn those fuels, they're gone, and we're not going to get them back. 
Burning wood in a fireplace stove insert converts 70% of the energy in the wood to heat, twice as much as burning coal for electrical heat. An open hearth fireplace, by comparison, uses more heat energy than the fire produces. It draws heated room air into the fireplace and sends it up the chimney. So if you're concerned about wasting energy, be sure the fireplace has glass doors to help reduce the loss of heat. With the fireplace stove insert, though, you can get most of the heat out of the wood. To burn wood safely and cleanly, then, you need these four things. Dry wood, a safe stove, a proper chimney, and maintenance. As we just learned, trees are a renewable source of energy. At the rate we're using oil and gas, which are non-renewable energy sources, we'll probably face more shortages in our lifetimes. So anything we can do to conserve energy now will make our transition to renewable forms of energy like solar, wind, water, and wood easier. And planting and caring for trees is something each of us can do. As you watch our final story, Local Relief, notice what you need to do to grow a strong, healthy tree. Most trees for planting start their lives in a greenhouse. You can buy a bare root seedling, like this Norway pine, or an older tree that comes in its own container. Plan ahead, think about the kind of tree you want, and don't hurry. It's a decision you'll want to be proud of the rest of your life. Well, I think the first thing you need to do is go and pick a really nice, healthy tree. And look for a tree that is nice and sturdy, with a straight trunk. Once you've got a healthy tree, pick a good spot to plant it. Imagine how big it will be when it's mature, and pick a spot with lots of soil around it. You also don't want to plant a tree in the shade. You need to find a nice sunny place to put that tree, because the more light the tree gets, the more photosynthesis is taking place, and that, of course, builds up food for the tree to grow. Now comes the fun part, digging the hole. It should be at least six inches bigger than the container on all sides, and only as deep as the original container. You don't want to plant it really deep. You don't want to let it sit up so that the roots are going to be above the level of the surrounding soil. Get it nice and even. Then loosen the sides of the hole so the roots can grow, and fill the hole, firming the soil as you go. Finally, build a moat to help hold water. we got to get some wood chips. Once you're through planting it, you probably should do some mulching. I like to use wood chips because they're a nice, organic, natural-looking material. Mulch will keep the tree's roots cooler and retain moisture. Watering, of course, is important. The trees have to be watered regularly, but you don't want to water them every day. In normal weather, once a week is average. Dig up a little soil to see if it's dry. Then give the roots a good soaking, but don't overwater or underwater. Finally, protect the tree from damage. Winter's freeze and thaw can be prevented with a tree wrap. Your tree, with a little care, will give you years of pleasure. According to Ojibwa tradition, when you take a tree from the forest, you must plant two trees to take its place so that the forest is replenished. Trees take a long time to grow, so to get the benefits we need, we better start planting them now. If you have more questions about planting trees, contact the Extension Office in your county. The people there and at the College of Natural Resources at the University helped us with the questions we had for this series. Thanks to all of them. Can you name the steps in planting and caring for a tree? The answers for the worksheet are plant, mulch, water regularly, and protect. And if we all plant trees this spring, we'll be sure to have forests forever. I'm Mike Fairborn. And I'm Matt Balow from Weather Center 4.